You ever been kayaking? How many have been kayaking before? Great. I'm sure you guys are great at it. So the first time uh, I went kayaking, I was in middle school, and I was going with uh, my, my girlfriend, if you call it that. It was my first ever girlfriend. Uh, and I didn't even know, by the way, I was getting into a relationship. She came up to me one day and said, you're my boyfriend. And I was at the age where I was playing Pokemon on a Game Boy Color under the library table, and I didn't know how to say no. I said, I'm your boyfriend, I guess. Okay. She's like, we're going kayaking. I was like, never been. So we went kayaking on the Tualatin River, and uh, I got in this kayak, and they gave me an oar. And at, when I was in middle school, I was, um, I think the word for it is dumb. You know, like I just wasn't smart. And so figuring out how to, you know, really move, it would be like I would turn one way and then I'd turn one way and I'd go ro the wrong way. And we were going sort of downstream. And at one point we had a stop at a dock and I'm like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And I overshot. I missed it. And that means the only way back was to go upstream. The problem was is that I didn't know how to kayak, and I was terrible. And I was trying to go upstream, and I was just sort of turning and moving, and I wasn't actually gaining any meaningful ground. I'm like, oh, no. I'm dead. They lost a kayak. I feel bad, right? I'm embarrassing myself. I don't know what to do. And they're like, come on, come on. And I knew it was possible because I saw other people doing it, but for me, it wasn't. It really actually wasn't possible. And so I end up just sort of turning to the side of the river and just going into like a bunch of bushes and stopping and be like, this is, this is where I can go. All right. The dock is upstream and I'm not getting there. And so someone actually had to come out, get into the kayak and do it for me. And they were much better than me. I remember I was actually holding on. I was small. So I was on the back of it. It's a one person kayak. And I'm on the back like, hey, right? And they're going. I'm like, wow, you can actually move pretty fast in these things. That's sweet. And I did nothing. I just stood there. But in, in life, the reality is, is that sometimes it feels like we are always sort of going against the cultural current. And sometimes it feels like, man, it's really hard to do this, especially on our own. Now, there's this really uh, funny meme. If you're old, you, don't, you may not know that older, sorry. Uh, you might not know what a, a meme is necessarily, but you know the things that you share on Facebook that are just pictures with words on it? Well, that's a meme. There's this really popular one where it says that, you know, the older generation worked really hard and endured a lot of hard things so that their kids could have an easier life. And then when their kids have an easier life, the older generation looks at them and says, oh, look how spoiled these kids are. Like, wait, you, you fought to give us this easier life, and now you're mad at us for having an easier life. Well, I don't want to say that as Christians we have an easier life. But in the verse that we're going to see, we do have a different way. It is a new way as Christians that we have that was not like it was in the past where we had to work really hard only to realize that we're failures. You work really, really hard in order to try to follow certain rules only to realize that you can't. Then you try to make it right through sacrifices only to realize you're struggling against the current and there's no way that you'll actually get to where you need to get. You're going to fail. But as Christians, we have a new way. Now, I want to be really careful not, not to tell you that this is an easier way. It is a new way. It is a different way, but it's not easy because it requires that you give up so that somebody else can do it for you. This is what faith in Jesus looks like. You taking a step back, you becoming less, so that Christ can become more in your life. There's a famous song out there by a very popular Christian artist. Jesus, take the wheel. I don't think that's a Christian artist, is it? <laughs> oh, she's almost, mm. 
No, but Jesus, take, in other words, take over my life. You do it because I can't. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot of that in this verse. I want to tell you one more thing, too, before we get into this verse. All right, so we're going to see what it means to let Jesus take control of our lives. And then we're also going to discuss a really nuanced topic. Because some people have said, hey, you, you need works. Some people have said, you, you only need faith. Well, first of all, it's this. Faith is what saves you. So what's the role of works? And I want to give you a really quick example. If I went up to somebody and I said, hey, I want you to try out this new glue. It's great. I lo- it's, it's some of the best glue I've ever used. I say, sure. And I hand them a thing of Best Foods mayonnaise. Now they take out this mayonnaise and they're like, all right, I'm going to try to glue something here. And they're going to find out that that's terrible glue. Mayonnaise doesn't work for glue. It's not going to stick anything to the sheet. And they tell you this isn't glue. You say, of course it's glue. It identifies as glue. I know this is a weird era. This, this is glue. Like, but part of being glue is that it has to stick. In other words, part of the very nature of glue is that it is sticky. Part of the very nature of what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and therefore to be a Christian is that you do produce good works. In other words, if you are not producing works, it is only a testament of what you actually are. It's not that you have to produce good works to be saved. It's that you do produce good works if you're saved. Does this make sense? I, I, we're going to go into that, but it needs to know, you need to know that the very nature of a Christian is that you will have a transformed life, and that transformed life will look a certain way. Well, let's read the passage. I'm going to be on time today. Okay, Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the fresh and living way that he inaugurated for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in the, in the assurance that faith brings, because we have had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And let us hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess For the one who made the promise is trustworthy. And let us take thought uh, of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. I just got done doing, I have a few more today, but a lot of graduation parties so I, I'm a, a chaplain and a high school teacher, and uh, I also teach some middle school classes. So the kids who were graduating, many I've had since seventh grade, uh, and it's always sad to, to end the year because you realize that these kids will never sit in your class again, and you've had them for so long. And one of the things that COVID taught me uh, as an educator is that nothing Nothing can replace physical relationship with one another. I realized very quickly when I was online how much I lost. I was used to having these kids around me, and when you can look at somebody in the eyes, and when you can, you can see their faces, right, They'll turn their cameras off. They won't be present. They'll sort of hide behind this digital wall, and you lose something really important. And I'm, I'm getting a little scared for the church because that's still sort of happening, where we think that we can replace the church with just the stuff we view online. And I have to tell you that nothing can replace that physical relationship we share with one another when we are close to them. I don't know what it would look like to try to attend those grad parties online. Hey, I'm online watching you. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense. 
to be present with another person is fundamentally important. And so what we do here in this, in this fellowship with one another is that we are physically present. And, and church is that. Church in fellowship is physical presence with one another. That doesn't mean that it's not good or healthy to watch things online or to research more, but recognize that we all need that sort of fellowship. And it, you know what I felt like online? when I was even with people talking with them over the internet, it felt like I was alone. And I think that maybe a lot of us felt that way during that era, if you had to do things online, you felt alone. And one of the things I advocated for, I study Generation Z professionally right now, I'm getting my uh, PhD studying Generation Z in intercultural education, it's really fun. But one of the scariest things that I saw was that the teen suicide rate during COVID era multiplied by an order of magnitude. Young people, when they felt alone, were giving up and giving in to some of their hardest struggles. And it breaks my heart because I, I, I just wish that they had people that they could be around. And one of the biggest motivators for why the quarantine ended for schools was just that here in Oregon, recognizing that young people who didn't have physical interaction with people were taking their lives. And it was very sad. And so I want us to recognize just how important it is to meet with one another. And I think we all have a sense of it after that COVID era. But since we didn't go all the way through Hebrews, I want to give you some indication as to what was talked about, because a lot of it was sort of high theology is, is what they call it. Very uh, very clear theological ideas. First, it's uh, we have an earthly an earthly priest, and that Jesus is that heavenly priest uh, who can go into this holy place. Um, we have uh, a lot of temple talk. Uh, in fact, in First Corinthians, it says something really important that that will tie into this, and that's we are a temple. We probably heard that a lot, that you are a temple. Um, and that Jesus changed the whole idea of a temple. So there, the temple was this big structure that had an outer court where Gentiles could be, that was non-Christians, and it had an inner court called the women's court because Jewish men and women would go in there and they're only allowed. There are big signs on the outside that said, if you're not a Jew, don't enter or we kill you. That's how serious they were. And in, in that inner court is where they would exchange things uh, like money, because you could only use the Tyrian half shekel uh, in order to uh, purchase things in there, which is too bad because no one had a Tyrian half shekel. You had Roman currency, so you'd have to go and exchange, and then people were ripping you off. And you had to have unblemished animals for your sacrifices. The problem was that people were also ripping you off. A priest would look at it and say, this animal you brought, it had a blemish. You'd be like, where? It's like, don't, don't question me. You need to go buy one. Well, you didn't have money to buy one. You had to exchange your money for a Tyrian half shekel. You get ripped off there, then you get ripped off the animal. It's like saying, you know where? I want some candy. I'm going to go to the movie theater to buy it. That'd be the dumbest thing you've ever done, right? Because the movie theater is charging $5 for something you can get for $1 at the Dollar Tree. They were doing, they're ripping people off. That's where Jesus in that inner court went and he turned the tables over and he drew and he whipped all the animals out. And he said, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. That was there in that inner court. Then you had the sanctuary. Now this area, you, uh, or sorry, even inner was the court of Israel where only the men could be, sorry ladies. And then you had the sanctuary where only the high priest could go because the sanctuary had the most important place called the Holy of Holies. And this place had a huge curtain. Now we know in Matthew, when Jesus died, that curtain was ripped, because in that Holy of Holies is where it was said that God dwelled. And by ripping, so it says uh, that, he, that Jesus inaugurated the new way for us through the curtain. That is through his flesh. So when Jesus died, that curtain was ripped open, meaning that the presence of God, where we once thought it was in one place, was now 
available to us. I think it's so cool because it's saying you used to, the idea was if you wanted to, to be near God, you'd have to go to this place. But now it's saying we realize that you aren't, will never be good enough to actually be in this place, so God's going to come to you. Where's the temple now? You are the temple. God has come to you. And so through the person of Jesus inaugurating this, God now comes to us through the person of Jesus who got rid of this holy of holies. And now, by the way, this is a perfect high priest in Jesus. Let me tell you the biggest issue with the high priest. If you read through the Old Testament, the number one issue with the high priest, and this would be the worst job you ever want to get, ever. So if there was, if we were living in the Old Testament times and you're like, hey, I, I need a job, and someone said, hey, high priest pays well, you should say no. Because the number one issue with the high priest is that they just always died. It's all the time. Why did they die? Because they thought, okay, I think I'm ready. Going into the Holy Holies. I did the sacrifice. I did the ritual purity. My heart's right. Hey, I did it all, right? And then they had a rope tied around you, so then they just pull you back in. Pull you out, and like, ah, another one died, right? If you need a job that ties a rope around you because you might die on the inside and no one wants to save you, stay away from it. So Jesus is, is demonstrating that none will be good enough except for him. And so he did it for us. And by doing so, he's ripped the curtain away. And so now you have access to God. Now, in, in some understandings, and here's where I think uh, the, the Catholic understanding gets it wrong. Because uh, if, if you know anything about the Catholic understanding, it's that there is these intercessors. It's called the intercessory of the saints. And it's that you can pray to somebody other than Jesus or to God. And they liken it to this. If you want to go over to somebody's house, maybe it's your friend Brett or for the ladies, Ashley. Okay, you want to go over to their house and you say, hey, your mom, she's kind of a tyrant. You know her really well, so I shouldn't be the one to go and ask her and say, hey, can I sleep over tonight? You should. So can you talk to your mom for me and advocate for me so that I can come over? And so their understanding is this, you, you pray to Mary or Anthony or Patrick or other, any other saints, and you say, hey, God's kind of a big deal, and uh, you know, I'm kind of intimidated. Do you mind talking to God for me and letting him know, like, hey, I'd really like to find my keys that I lost, Anthony, right? Can you do that for me? Or Mary, you're, you know, being the mother of Jesus and all, can you talk to the big guy for me and let him know just you know how much I need some help right now. For me, that defeats the entire purpose of this section, which says we now have a high priest and advocate in the person of Jesus alone. No other person can do what Jesus alone does for us. We should be praying to Jesus because he is our advocate right? And how can we do that? Because the presence of the Holy Spirit is in us ourselves, because we are the temple. But I want to tell you uh, two English truths. If anyone out there is maybe an English teacher, uh, you'll know this. But there are uh, two ways of, of linking truth. It's an indicative and an imperative. And the Bible likes to link these two things together, an indicative and an imperative. Many of you are like, I don't know what those mean. Let me tell you. An indicative indicates what the truth is. And an imperative says, what should we do in light of that? So if this is true, then what should we do because of it? So the indicative and the imperative, and we're going to see this uh, really clearly in the book of Hebrews, because it says this, this is the truth that Jesus made an entirely new way for us. He inaugurated a new way for us by ripping the curtain in half, becoming our sole high priest so that now we can be saved through Jesus alone. And whenever we have issues, whenever we have problems, 
we can give it to Jesus alone. No sacrifices, nothing. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Everything we do is through him now. And if that's true, it gives us three statements here in, in Hebrews. It says, this is the truth. And then it will start with, let us, let us, let us. This is true, so let us do this, let us do this, and let us do this. So the first one is, let us draw near to God, fully assured in faith. The next one is, let us hold fast to confession without wavering. And the third one is, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. So let's take them uh, one at a time. You're going to see, by the way, that in verse 19, it says, therefore. So it, before that, uh, all of this, in light of everything that Jesus is for us, therefore, and then in 22 through 25 verses, let us do this, let us do this, let us do this. Okay. The first one is let us draw near. It says this in verse 22. Therefore, dot, dot, dot. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The first application of Jesus' person and his work is to simply come. The fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a standing invitation that you are welcome to the holy place. And one of the hardest things sometimes for us is to give up ourselves, our pride, and just give it to Jesus. You know, I used uh, an example not that long ago when I was preaching about uh, what the standard procedure for search and rescue is, uh, which their number one rule is, is to do nothing. If you find yourself lost, stop, sit down, and wait. That's how you get saved. Quit trying to do it on your own. I find myself all the time, and Ashley will have to remind me, Ashley, my wife, she's back in the kids' ministry, she's my biggest advocate, is I just get so heartbroken when I'm investing in kids, and I just, I, I, maybe I feel like they're not getting it, and I want to do more, and I want to do more, and I want to do more, and she has to say, stop. Like, you can't do it for them. You can't want Jesus for them. You can't love Jesus for them. You can only be an example. You have to just stop putting all of this on yourself. And so many of, of you, and certainly me, will put so much on ourselves, and we'll try to do it all on our own. We'll try to get it all fixed on our own, and it just doesn't work. I had a uh, young man that I was uh, counseling at school, and I heard because uh, I was talking to someone who wrote on a survey that said, you know, I, no one loves me, I'm not valuable, and I hate being here at this school. And I thought, oh, well, this, this kid needs some investment. So I went and I was talking to him, and he, he was like, look, I just feel like I know people who aren't Christians, who are better than all these kids. He's so bitter. And he gave an example of one who went to that school. He said, this guy, he's one of the best people I know, and he doesn't even call himself a Christian because he doesn't think that he's worth it. So I had a good discussion with him, uh, and then, but then I went to that other kid, and I said, is it true that you don't call yourself a Christian? And this young man said, well, yeah, because I just, I'm not good enough. I, 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 I try, but I can't get my mind always in the right place. I can't always do the right things. And I said, wake up. That's what it is to be a Christian, is to recognize you'll never be good enough. It's to recognize you won't always be perfect. Jesus didn't say, get healthy, then come to me, because I only want healthy people around me. Jesus said, I've come for the sick and I have no part with the healthy. In other words, if you think you're healthy, 
Good luck. I've come for the sick. And the real trick to being a Christian is to recognize you are sick. That you will sin, that you'll get it wrong, that you won't, you won't always think the right way. That you need to quit trying to be perfect on your own, quit trying to get it right on your own, and to sit down and let Jesus save you. That's the hardest part, is to give up yourself so that Jesus can do it for you. We have a Savior who is struggling to save us because we are really hard at saving when we just flail and try to do it on our own. And so uh, as as an educator, I recognize just how difficult it can be to give up my own pride of thinking I can save somebody because I can't. I can only point them to the one who saves. But we need to be assured of our faith. And and when we are assured of our faith, it cleans our conscience. So maybe some of you out there are still feeling unworthy, like, man, I, I just still do this, and I still do that, and, and I, I have all of these issues in, in the way. You know what? It's good to be convicted of sin. What's not good is if that sin prevents you from experiencing the real relationship with Jesus. Recognize that Jesus loves you just as much now as he did before or after. That, uh, as the song goes, you'll never be more loved than you are right now. And recognizing that you can be fully assured of your hope for the future because of what Christ has done for you. No matter what you're doing or what you've done or what you will do, sin, past, present, and future was on that cross. And if you are trying to do something to save yourself, then you are trying to work your way into heaven, which is exactly what Jesus came to prevent us from having to do. So, uh, we do this in other ways, where we try to sort of uh, self-justify things in order to uh, justify the way that we're feeling or doing rather than just laying it down at Jesus. I'll give you an example, like, uh, have you ever, I'll give you, my wife, she gets home, and she's had a long day at work, and so she might snap at me and say something, and I'm like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't deserve that. And then, It would be easy, my wife doesn't typically do this, so I can say this, it would be easy for her to say, well, uh, the only reason I snapped was because this person's not doing enough, this needs to happen, this needs to change. In other words, we try to justify our behavior. We try to justify the things that we say or do. Uh, Maybe we do it with, you know, had this person not worn that outfit. My goodness, I wouldn't have lusted in this way. If that person hadn't been so dumb, I wouldn't be so angry at them and snapped at them. Had this person just done this, we try to sort of self-soothe, self-justify. We try to give good reasons for why we act in a way that we shouldn't. And what it means to be a Christian is to look at ourselves and say, I shouldn't do that, and I shouldn't try to justify it. I should just lay it at the feet of Jesus. And if we get used to just giving our sin rather than trying to self-soothe and justify our sin, we're going to find ourselves growing and maturing in a way that you would never have expected. I tell my students this is just called ownership. Don't look and try to say, but this person or that person, just own what you can and say, I did this. I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. And it's amazing how when we lay those things at Jesus, how forgiveness of ourselves through Jesus helps us forgive other people. Changed hearts changes people. And changed people can help change people. 
right? And so we, we need to be practicing laying our sins at the feet of Jesus and not trying to self-soothe. I, I, I really have to move faster. I'm so sorry. Um, the next is, uh, let us hold fast. And it's uh, in verse 23. It says, now remember, this is following from the therefore. Another, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So what is the confession that we're uh, supposed to hold fast to? It is clear that it is a promise. He says that we are to hold fast the confession of our hope because he who promised is faithful. It's the promise of our hope, the gospel, the good news that the king has come to win his kingdom, that he has ransomed his people in his own blood, and that he has fulfilled the law that we were in the process of creatively breaking at every point. So we need to trust in the promise of Jesus. Uh, The example that I've given before, so I'll say it quickly, is... uh, the, the example of the Twin Towers when they were up, uh, there's a tightrope that was drawn between them, and a man uh, walked across them, and there was a crowd watching, and they were amazed that this guy could tightrope across uh, these towers at such a high altitude. The wind was really blowing, but he did it, and he did it with relative ease. And he asked them, how many of you think that I can make it back? And they all said, oh, yeah, we've seen you go forward. You can come back. And so he does. He goes right back. And then he takes a wheelbarrow, and he goes, and he goes across, you know, bounce, wavering, he goes across, and he says, how many of you think I can make it back? And they're like, oh, yeah, you did it the first time. Of course you could do it. And then he fills this wheelbarrow up, big old bags of flour, and you see the tension go down. It's a little more droopy, and he goes, and he makes it. He says, how many people think I can make it back? I'm like, absolutely. What? Yeah, we believe you can. So he goes and he makes it back. Then he asks, now how many people think I can go across with a person inside the wheelbarrow? They all said, oh yeah, you did it with flour, right? That weighed a lot. Oh, absolutely, we believe you can do it. And he says, all right, who wants to volunteer? Not a hand goes up. If we are holding fast to our confession of faith, It means that we actually trust in Jesus and his promises. And when I do uh, baptism, I just did some baptisms recently at the beach. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I've told you before, it's one of my favorite things to do because the water is so terribly cold. Uh, Somebody asked me when I did it because I hurt my ankle pretty badly. He said, hey, was it hard on your ankle? I said, no, you know, I actually didn't feel it at all. Why? Because once you get out there, you don't feel much at all. You go out into the water. And man, that first few steps is absolutely chilling. And I do, I try to always do it with like a smile because I'm the one leading the pack. I'm like, hey, this is easy. <laughs> and it's not, right? It's terrible. I'm like, I hope my body gets used to this because I, I can barely handle it. And you might not know this, but the Jordan River sometimes is actually 10 degrees colder than the Oregon coast the river into which Jesus himself was baptized, it is freezing. And so to go out into this water, and I have usually a group of kids all holding hands as they go out. The waves are hitting you. Uh, One time we went out on rocks, which was a terrible idea. So you're like stepping on rocks, trying to get out into this ocean. They keep, not only is it cold, but the waves make it really difficult to actually get you under the water. You're having to watch. You're having to be really attentive to your surroundings. It is so hard to baptize in the ocean for multiple reasons. And that is the point. The point is that if we trust Jesus, it means we'll trust him even when he's taking us through hard places. Even when it is difficult, even when it is hard, and even when we don't understand. So part of following Jesus is our willingness to go through hard places. Trusting in Jesus to take us across high places, hard places, and to areas maybe that we don't understand or know. And I, the discussion I often have with kids is, is Jesus the Lord of your life or are you? 
if you are unwilling to follow Jesus into places because you don't understand, then all you're saying is, I only do things that I understand. Who is the Lord of your life? You will not always understand the ways of the Lord because his ways are higher, he's bigger, he's better, he's perfect, and you are not. And if we only follow Jesus when we understand, then we are the actual lords of our life and he is not. Sometimes it will be exceptionally difficult to follow Jesus, primarily because we don't understand where he's taking us. And I hope that you would be willing to follow a perfect God who's bigger than you are. And so we need to hold fast to our confession of faith. In other words, guys, we need to mean it. We need to mean it when we say that we believe in Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And sometimes that will cost us our own understanding. I'm doing great. Okay. The uh, really cool, uh, really quickly, I want to say, I, I know I've talked a lot about, um, if you haven't been here, about a young woman. Her name's Megumi. And uh, Megumi means blessing in Japanese. She's a Japanese girl uh, that was part of one of those baptisms. And uh, she uh, gave her life to Jesus and then had a tough conversation uh, with her father because her father, before she left Japan, said, Yes, go to the United States, have fun, listen to your teachers, but one thing, you're not allowed to become a Christian. Well, she became a Christian. And she was afraid that her father would kick her out and it wouldn't be good. And uh, Jerry actually sent me a really cool picture because after graduation, uh, her father, who was there, and Megumi came and we got to talk. So there's a picture of me talking to Megumi and her father. And one of the things I thought it was really cool that... Uh, he was concerned about. One, he was accepting. I was like, oh, this is awesome. He, he's accepting. He's not saying, I'm going to kick you out, because he did tell her, just remember where your money's coming from. Uh, so it was a sort of, uh, if you don't do what I want, then I'll cut you off, and then you'll be in trouble. But he didn't. He didn't. He was accepting. He even tried to look up to see if he could find Christian churches. He was unsuccessful. Um, but he was really concerned. He said, well, wait, this means that you have to marry a Christian? And she's like, yes. And he's like, oh, there are no Christians in Japan, as he, he's thinking. He's like, there's no Christians in our family. There, there's no community. No, you'll be all alone. You'll have nothing. It will be really hard. It will just be really hard, and I'm afraid, Megumi, you're going to get hurt. And through Megumi, I was able to say to him, if Megumi was in trouble and you could save her, but you'd get hurt, would you do it? He said, oh, yes, 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 yes. He said, Megumi, if your father, he's in trouble and you could save him, but, but you're going to get hurt, would you do it? She's like, absolutely, yes. And it's because you really love each other, huh? Yeah, and it's because you think you're, you guys are worth it, right? Well, yes. I said, I can't promise you that you won't get hurt. I can't promise you that it won't be hard. I can only promise you that it will be worth it. And I love seeing his face because he understood that sometimes good things, right things, true things are worth being hurt for. And uh, I was convicted by this though because the last thing I want is, is to sort of have a Christian who's brand new in the faith go off into an environment where they have no community. And so last Sunday, uh, my, my father who, who's here, uh, he's the president of a university that does a lot of missions work. I attend that school, but I, I couldn't think of a single Japanese missionary that's in any of my cohorts. I, we, we have so many missionaries all across the world, but I couldn't think of a single Japanese one. And so my dad, he said, you know what? I think I know one. I said, okay, I mean, it's in Tokyo. It's a big area. Uh, and he said, okay, I'll, I'll send her address, Megumi's address, to this missionary that I know, and maybe we can get her connected with community. Guy's name is Andrew Miko. His wife's Japanese. They're Baptist missionaries there uh, in Japan. 
and they do discipleship of young believers. Oh, that would be perfect. He emails back and he says, I laughed when I saw this address. It's three minutes away by train. They travel train primarily in Japan. It's only three minutes away in train. It's like, we will absolutely be able to disciple Megumi. And I just saw the hand of God at work. And the idea is to trust that God has an awesome plan all for his own glory. And that this person would not be alone. That this would all work. Here I thought, I'm going to have to try really hard to figure this out, to get her connected with community. And it was only an email away. And I just want us to do the same thing. We may not always understand, but we, one, have to be willing to be hurt. We have to be willing to do hard things if this is the truth, because the truth is worth fighting for. And lastly, this is a really important one, it's let us consider one another. So the third let us, which has three parts, is found in verse 24 and 25. Uh, it says, uh, stir one another up to love and good works. Don't neglect meeting as some have done. And then also encourage one another, especially as the day draws near. I'm going to try to put these together. But I, I, I compiled a, some verses together to talk about what it is to be a Christian and what sort of flows out of that. Because uh, I need us to ditch the sort of easy believism. So in our culture, there's this idea where we just sort of believe, and that doesn't actually change us. And we treat Christianity as this vending machine, where we just sort of believe, and because we believe, we can ask and get sort of whatever we want. It's the blessing machine. I believe, and the reason I believe is because it will give me any number of these things. But to have a transformed heart is to produce fruit. And here are some of the verses. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew, that's Matthew 5, 16. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound in you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Colossians 1.10 says, Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All Scripture is created out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Titus 2, 7, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good work. Titus 2.14, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Titus 3.8a, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves for good works. Titus 3.14, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. There is this sense at which if we are Christian, then we will be producing certain behaviors and certain actions. When I, when I tell my kids this, I give them the example of if my wife, not my wife, sorry, if my mom came up to me, totally different people, to be clear. If my mom came up to me and she said, Matthew, I love you. She does say that. It's beautiful. 
She actually says, Matthew, I love you so much, it's disgusting. And uh, to some degree, that's true. But if then she took out a pair of jumper cables and she started to beat me with them. And she would do that, and maybe she locked me in a room growing up. She'd say, Matthew, I love you, but she never fed me. She would beat me endlessly for no reason. And she would also call me terrible names and neglect me. I recognize that she's saying that she loves me. But we also must recognize that her actions say otherwise. And Jesus said, it is by your fruit that you will know them. In other words, you can know what something is by what something does. And uh, this, this then idea that if you are a Christian, then you simply will be fruitful. And that fruit needs to be how we interact with one another. And it's really uh, important that we don't neglect meeting with one another. Now, I love Billy Graham, but let me tell you one, only one dangerous thing that came out of that movement. It was an individualized personal faith. It said, do you have an individual personal faith in Jesus. And some took that to mean, so long as I have this individual personal faith, I don't need to be interacting with other people. But it says in John 8, 12, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. Part of being a Christian is meeting with one another. Why, as Chad said last week, so that we can encourage or exhort one another. I was having a conversation with Jerry uh, recently, and it was about how if somebody tells you that they're a Christian, then we actually have a responsibility to hold them accountable to what that means. If you say you are a Christian, but you aren't living in a Christian way, we do have an, a, a responsibility to encourage them to live in a Christian way, to maybe exhort them to live in the right way, part of being a Christian is holding one another accountable to be better and to get better and to do better. And so this reality of meeting with one another is about meeting needs and encouraging one another and blessing each other. Nothing can replace the real fellowship that we have with one another, what it is to meet face to face. And the Bible is very clear. In fact, that word meeting together uh, actually comes from the word synagogue, that you are to be synagogue. You are to meet, you are to be gathered, you are to be present with one another, and some have abandoned this. And by abandoning the meeting, you have cut yourself off from the encouragement and exhortation that comes from what it is to be present with one another. And I want us to be encouraged. In fact, as we go forward as a church, one of the things I want to really emphasize is getting back to the basis of what it is to live in community and to love one another. The simple truth of the gospel is that we invest in love with one another because Jesus died for us and loved us first. And I want that to be an emphasis for us. I want that to be something that we do. And um, let me just give a few of the uh, examples or metaphors that the Bible uses for church. In 1 Corinthians, it says that we're a body comprised of many parts. It says we're God's house in Hebrews 3. It says that we're a temple for God to dwell in in 1 Peter 2, that we're a chosen people in 1 Peter 2. It also says we're a holy nation and a royal priesthood and a people of God's possession, all in 1 Peter 2 that we're a family in Romans 8, that we're an army in Revelation 19, and that we are a massive earth-covering tree in Matthew 13. And so to reduce Christianity to just this personal relationship, we do so at our own peril. We are not just a personal relationship with Jesus. We are a collective fellowship who are made stronger when we stand together. And it is my prayer for this church going forward that we would be a community that stands together, that loves one another, and that encourages one another to be better and to do better and to love better. And that is my prayer. And I want to pray that now. 
Lord, I thank you that we are your church. And I pray that we would be faithful in living as your church, faithful in meeting with one another, faithful in encouraging one another, faithful, God, in exhorting one another even when it is difficult. You are a big God who we cannot see around, but I pray that we would trust you nonetheless, even when we don't understand. God, thank you that in light of what you've done for us, that there is so much that we can be responding with. God, that we would be meeting with one another, encouraging one another, that we would be holding fast to the truth and trusting in your promises. God, I just pray that as a church, we would be doing just that. And I thank you again for our ability to meet so freely. And we love you in your precious name. Amen.